Myri, 4 p.m. Are you ready for the Word of God today? Come on, why don't you stand on your feet? We're going to read Scripture together. We're going to honor the Word of God. And, um, you know, whenever we, we read a text, I just want to remind you that it is, it is um, you, you have the license to get excited about the Word of God. If, if something about what we're reading resonates in your spirit, you just shout amen, yep, that's for me, so on and so forth. I'm going to take you to the New Testament where Jesus has returned back to his hometown in Nazareth. And as he does on the Sabbath, he visits the local synagogue. It's at this main synagogue in Nazareth that they hand him a book. The book is essentially like a scroll, but it's a collection of uh, Old Testament prophecies. And Jesus opens the book and he reads a 700-year-old prophecy about himself. How many of you have ever received a prophetic word? How many of you have written it down or have listened to it again and, and, and have experienced faith enter into your heart? Well, the king of kings has just entered the room and he is reading a 700-year-old prophecy about himself. So you can cue some suspenseful music right now in your head because that's where my head's going. It says here, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read, which is what we're doing. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attend attendant and sat down and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. He began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Can we give Jesus a big shout of praise? <laughs> Jesus reads a prophecy about himself and then goes, I'm the man. I am fulfilling what you've just heard right now. And so today I want to speak to you on the thought, the best you. As you grab your seat, turn to someone and say, hey, the best you. It's going to be discovered today. Say, it's going to be discovered today. <laughs> if this passage in Luke chapter 4 isn't like the ultimate mic drop moment in all of the New Testament, I don't know what is. Jesus is reading a prophecy about himself. And so I want to set the record straight this afternoon, right from the get-go, a theology for you to stand on about why Jesus came. Why did divinity come in the form of humanity? How did God, who is divine, come onto the earth, and why did he come in the form of our flesh, human flesh? You need to understand that Jesus didn't just come to the earth, die on the cross, and rise again to simply give you a ticket to heaven. He did so much more than that. Some of you are saying, what are you saying? There is so much more. Jesus didn't just die and rise again to get you to eternal life. But he died and rose again to give you an abundant life right here and now on earth. I'm convinced that his agenda to come and give you your best life on earth was not just for your sake. But I believe that the reason why Jesus died and rose again to give you your best life on earth right now is because he really loves the people that have got to put up with you. And so Jesus died and rose again, not just to give you eternal life, but to bring out the best you right here and now on the earth. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus fleshes this out a little bit more. He says the thief being the enemy, the devil comes, does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I, Jesus says, have come that they, being humanity, may have life. This word life is zoe, meaning the abundant, full, whole life, and that they may have it more abundantly. So as if you think that having a whole Zoe life isn't enough, Jesus says, I'm going to give you that in abundance. Yeah. Yeah. So Jesus' entire intent of coming to the earth in human form was not just to save you to eternity, but to give you an abundant eternal life right here and now. Jesus knows that you are at your best when your life is whole. That's why at Nations Church, one of our culture statements is that we're about wholeness. Because we believe that the best you is a whole you. 
The best version of you, the version that Jesus died and rose again for, is a whole you. Jesus proclaimed in front of the entire synagogue the entire reason why the Father sent him. It says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He, being the heavenly Father, has sent me to heal the broken hearted. That word often loses people, particularly the blokes, because that expression broken hearted conjures up all kinds of romance movies about the jilted lover and the, the unrequited love and, and all the heartache and all of that. But it's not like that. I'm going to unpack this whole phrase later on in my, in my message. But this whole idea of Jesus being anointed and the reason why he's come in human form to heal the broken hearted speaks about the inside of all of us that has been separated from God. Jesus ultimately is the solution to everything that is broken internally in us because of our fallen state. Jesus also understood that your heart is the central motivating factor of your life. The word heart here is the word cardia, to which we get the English word cardio, which essentially means your, the, the seat of your mind, your will, your emotions, the way that you feel about things, the way you, you think about things, the way you process external stimuli, the way that you relate to people outside of you makes sense to you. The Bible also concurrently uses the word soul. Soul is the word psyche, a distinct word to the word cardia, which is heart, but they essentially have the same meaning, the same definition, a bit like when we say animal and creature. Makes sense to you? Yeah. So, so that's why we get the expression heart and soul. Both, both heart and soul, cardia and psyche, speaks about the central motivating factor of our lives, the way that we process information, the way that we feel things, the way that, that, uh, that we interact and relate and respond to the world around us is always inevitably through the lens of our heart. When God created humanity, before Adam and Eve disobeyed God and sin entered into the world, our internal being, our heart, our cardia was created to reflect all that is the heart of God. Yeah. That alignment in complete unity and unison and synergy with God was broken when sin entered into the world. And when sin entered into the world, what was on the inside of us became corrupt. We were then no longer capable of reflecting the heart of God for this world. Am I making sense to you? And so from that moment on, God began to concoct and, 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 and bring to bear a plan to solve the human conditions problem. And the solution to that is Jesus, to which we see now in Luke chapter 4, Jesus is saying, I am now the fulfillment of the fundamental problem with the human heart. You're looking at him now, synagogue in Nazareth. I am the fulfillment and I am in the flesh right here and now, presenting to you as the healer of your heart. Thank God we've got a Jesus that didn't just die and rise again for us to wait to die to get to heaven. But he died and rose again so that we can have a Zoe life right now. And abundant and full and whole life right now. Jesus knew your heart is the center of your life because your heart is where you determine how you feel about your life. The heart is how you determine what you think about your life, your heart is, you know, these things determine how you react and respond and relate to people in your life. Every single aspect of your life right now, your marriage, your kids, the, the things that you busy yourself doing, your bank account, your career, your, your relationships, your extended family, the neighbors on either side of you, the left-hand side or across the road, the, the work colleagues, the team that are around, all of the things that your life bumps up against are all affected by the way that you feel about them. The state of your life right now has already been predetermined by how you feel about those different areas in your Am I talking to a church? Solomon, the smartest man in human history, says this, for as he or as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As a man perceives, feels, reasons in his heart, so is he. I want to make a really controversial statement right now because that's just how I roll. It really doesn't matter who God says you are. Some of you are going, oh, he's preaching heresy. It really doesn't matter who God says you are. What matters is how you feel about who God says you are. It, to, to, I got to be honest with you, it really doesn't even matter what I'm preaching to you right now. What matters is how you feel about what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. 
It's only a few weeks ago, I was having a chat to someone. I just finished preaching after one of our services here in Myrie, and they were saying to me, oh, you know, there's something you said that just so radically changed my life. And I came up and responded to the altar. Someone prayed, prophesied on me. I feel like something shifted. I feel so free. God has set me free from some stuff. And, and, and it was just, you could see uh, uh, almost like a physical change in them. God had, had completely done something. You know how when you, when you talk to someone and God has done something on the inside of their life? That same week, I had lunch with someone who was, I think, in the same service as the person that I talked to that I described before, and they were saying to me over lunch, you know, every time I come to church this last year, I feel nothing. I don't get anything out of your sermons. I struggle. It feels like so staged, so programmed. Spirit of God doesn't move. I want to struggle to keep coming to church. Same sermon. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Your reality is already framed by what you think about your reality. Come on, are you out there? Little wonder Solomon actually says, keep or guard your heart with all diligence. Not just like occasionally think about guarding your heart, but guard your heart with all diligence. Guard your heart, protect it, tend to it, with all diligence, like you're, like you're protecting a, a box of donuts from Krispy Kreme from your workmates. Protect it with all diligence. You know what I'm saying? Just, just guard that bad boy. For out of its spring, the issues of life. How many of you got issues? Me and about seven people in that corner over there. You're on this side going, I got no issues. How many of y'all got issues? If I have an issue with you, Solomon says that the issue has come out of my own heart. That's why it says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Some of us think that keep this word, keep or guard, means to keep a distance, keep an arm's length. And I've seen, I've heard so many introverts mis-exegete this scripture and using an excuse, I don't want to go to connect, I'm just guarding my heart. I just don't want to be around people, I just want to guard my heart. The word is natsa. That word that is the same word that you would describe the way a garden attends to a garden bed. Do you know what I'm saying? I know nothing about gardening, so, but I'm told people actually do this stuff. They kind of prune and they, they weed things and they put fertilizer and they kind of angle the pot so that the sun gets a certain way. And they're onto it all of the time because they understand that for that thing to be at its best, they need to tend to it. For its future fruitfulness, they need to tend to it. Keep, guard, natsa, tend to as a gardener would your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. And so it's not hard to see that if the enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy your Zoe life, what's he going to go after? Your heart. If he wants to bring disrepair and disunity between Mel Ludra and I, or me and my family, or me and other friendship circles, it's not hard to see what he's going to go after. He's going to go after my heart. He's going to bring what is toxic and dysfunctional and broken. And, 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 but see, I reckon that Jesus and the devil both know that you are at your best when you are whole. That's why Jesus says the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy the Zoe life. But I come to do the opposite, the antithesis, which is to give you a Zoe life and to give it to you in abundance. And for as long as you're living on this earth, there is actually a battle going on for your wholeness. See, the enemy knows that it is our heart that is the central motivating factor of our lives. It is where all of our realities emanate from. Jesus forewarned us by saying in Mark 7, 21, for from within, from within, this is great for all of you that like to blame other people. <laughs> for from within, out of the cardia of man, wow. proceed evil thoughts. You think you're smart and you work it all out in your brain? The Bible actually tells you that you emanate thought from your heart. For so many of us, our broken hearts, our dysfunctions, our, see, the, the, the inner health of, of that which God created for us to become is in such disrepair and we ignore it that our spirituality is lived out a bit like a shape of this bottle, or if you can imagine, like a champagne bottle shape, where we have all of the bigness of God. We've got all of our spirit being awakened. We, we, we have prophetic words that God speaks to us about. We have hopes. We have dreams. We have purposes that are deposited on the inside of us. But because we haven't given any time to our pursuit of wholeness, our hearts become the bottleneck that constrict the bigness 
of what is on the inside of you. Come on, are you out there? And so we, we live these lives with bigness on the inside of us, but, but frustrated day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year, because our hearts are not whole. There are fewer things more damaging than someone with a prophetic gift, but an offended heart. There are fewer things more damaging than someone with a strong intercessory gift. Come on, but a bitter heart. There are, there are fewer things with someone than someone who's got a strong leadership mantle on their life to lead people, to influence people, but they're a little bit screwy inside. Come on, you know what I'm saying? They're just a bit weird because they've been disillusioned and disappointed. And that translates to all manner of situations. That's why Jesus said, I am the solution for the bottleneck in your life. There is nothing more frustrating than for you to feel like God has actually called you to be a great wife to somebody, to find relationship, to give up your life wholly and to love a man. And yet you're full of fear and rejection and insecurity and you're needy and it's bottlenecking your relationships. There's nothing worse than to feel like God's called you to be a great man of God, to father children one day and to, and to lead a family. And yet, and yet the bottleneck of your visionless, purposelessness, or maybe you haven't dealt with issues from your own dad is bottle. Come on, am I speaking to a church? And yet Jesus says, I haven't come for you to live life shaped like this. I've come for you to live life shaped like this. So that all that I put on the inside of you will spring out without constriction and without limitation. Because the best you is a whole you. Am I preaching to a church? Luke chapter 4 in the New King James Version, which is a very popular translation in the English. Jesus said, he has sent me. The Father has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Luke chapter 4 in the NIV, the other equally popular English translation, translates it almost completely differently. It says this, Jesus said, He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. New King James Version, supposedly, Jesus said, He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. NIV, He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. The reason why the two classical schools of English translation did not translate them in the same way is because they couldn't decide which way to go. The original text actually means the same thing, that if you've got brokenness on the inside of you, it is a cage that imprisons you. And Jesus said, I've come to set you free. It's either you can call it healing or you can call it freedom. That's up to you, but it's being fulfilled in your hearing right now, so you might as well come to me. Jesus said, I'm here. I am being fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus has presented himself. Heaven has come to earth in human form. And you can have a healer right now. The best you is a whole you. Jesus said, don't wait till you die and get to heaven. Right now you can have a Zoe life. And I love the people connected to you too much for you not to be whole and healed and the best you. Come on. Yeah. The people that are going to put up with you, they're saying, come on, please get whole. <laughs> Just go to Jesus, please. Solomon says, guard your heart with all diligence. I find it interesting that so much of our time, talents, energies, efforts, focuses are on accumulating things that are on the outside of us rather than taking the Christ who's presented himself and bringing him into the inside of us where we need him the most. This stuff matters. This stuff matters for the things that you cannot count with cash, things that you cannot swipe with your credit card, all the things we spend all our time accumulating and buying and, and things that are made in China that end up on the drunk verge anyway. Stop expanding your life on things that don't really matter. Guard your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. And Jesus says, I am here. It's being fulfilled in your hearing. Get whole because the best you is a whole you. I'm going to take you to the Old Testament uh, of an account of a famous character in the Bible. But I'm going to talk to you about two parallel narratives that have divergent outcomes. It's out of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel of uh, the life of David. How many of you have heard of David? Yeah. When we were first introduced to David in 1 Samuel chapter 16, he's introduced to us at a time where Israel was ready for a new king. The current king at the time, King Saul, had disobeyed God and and uh, and. God was ready to appoint a new king for Israel. So he sends his prophet Samuel to the house of Jesse to choose a king out of all of Jesse's sons. To which Samuel rocks up at Jesse's house and, 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 and Jesse was all, you know, all, all pretty pumped because, you know, one of my sons is going to be king. ka -ching. Awesome. My superannuation sorted. And so he parades one son after another to which God says to Samuel, no, 
not this one, no, not this one, no, not this one, no, not this one. And then Samuel actually asked Jesse, well, do you have any other sons? How many of you know that something's very dysfunctional when you've got to ask a dad if there's any other sons? Right? If you ask me where are my kids, I'll show you all my kids. Right? To which you can almost hear Jesse choke on his own words. Well, <laughs> well actually, I've got him here one more on the pasture. He's just looking after my sheep. To which Samuel says, bring him in. We're not sitting down until he comes. Samuel anoints him to be king. But we're given some insight into immediately the life of David. There are very few things that wound a young man more than to grow up knowing that dad doesn't think very much of you. The narrative of David's life is one that dealt with him many different challenging, heartbreaking, tragic, painful accounts and happenings and circumstances in his life that just gave him so much to get over. How many of you agree that life just sometimes gives you stuff to get over? Yeah. Come on, how many of you have got had, stuff's been dealt to you in your life and you just had to get over it? Come on, yeah. you just had to deal with it. it, it's, it and, and David was living this kind of life where he had it's things to, to deal with and get over. And we flick the pages in 1 Samuel 17. He's been sent on assignment by his dad to bring some bread and cheese to his brothers that were fighting the Israelite army in the Valley of Elah. On one side is the Philistine army to which they had a giant by the name of Goliath yelling abuse and, and intimidation at the Israelite army. They're all frozen in fear. His own brothers, those that God had overlooked to become king, were fighting in this army and they also were frozen. The most highly trained military outfit in the world, frozen in fear, all dressed up, nowhere to go. The chosen frozen. They were like looking at their feet going... What, what do we do? Well, I, I, I don't know. He's pretty big, isn't he? David rocks up and hears Goliath speak once and, and said, I, I can't believe you guys are putting up with that. What do I need to do to take this clown down? And as soon as he opens his mouth, his own brother Eliab, who was one of his older brothers, started to accuse him of insolence and arrogance. Oh, you've come here to, to watch us and mock us. And, and make fun of us. I don't even know sometimes you become the recipient of someone else's toxicity because of what's going on in their life, not you. Maybe, just maybe, Eliab was being exposed for his lack of courage, being a trained soldier, when his baby brother, who's really a shepherd, was willing to take on the giant. It exposed his own failures and frailty. I don't know about you, but if you want to know what's really in your heart, I reckon this is always a good test. Put yourself in the constant presence of someone who is highly successful in the area you feel that like you're a failure in. If you want to really know what's going on in your heart, Get in the presence of someone who's doing extremely well in the area you're floundering in and watch what comes out of your mouth. Watch what it does. I'm going to talk to this side because they, they, it's, it's more real on this side. If you really want to know what's going on on the inside of your heart, put yourself right up close in proximity of someone who's doing very well in the area you're struggling in. See what comes out. Eliab says, you're insolent. How dare you? How dare you? Very few things wound a person more than someone close to them questioning their character. David had so much to get over. We fast forward and we look at his life and he's accelerated from shepherd boy to national hero in just a short amount of time. And I love to tell you that, that it's all hunky-dory for him and his life goes well, but it doesn't. From there, the king... At the time, King Saul was so incensed at his sudden rise in popularity that he hates him because of the sense of, of feeling threatened that he was going to usurp his throne. Again, insecurity, come on, projected onto some. And to the point where King Saul was so incensed at him that, that he threw a spear at David and narrowly misses his head and yells at him, I'm going to pin you to the wall. Some of you think you're bullied at work. I bet you your boss has never thrown a spear at your head. <laughs> this is like legit. <laughs> David had issues to deal with. From there, he gets chased like an animal. He's hiding out in caves. Come on, the, David had stuff to get over. We press fast forward and there's so much going on in David's life and so much has happened. Eventually, he assumes the role of king. He takes the throne of Israel. He rules and he governs with 
great astuteness and heart before God, make some mistakes. But we catch this account now that I want to take you to that has a, di- a, a, a convergence with a conversation with his wife, Michal. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, it is David's biggest, best, most significant day of his life. Have you ever had a day where you go, oh my gosh, this is the best day of my life? Have you ever had that? Some of you react like that when Nando's gets delivered by Uber Eats to your door. This is the best day of my life. I just, oh my gosh, I really needed it. <laughs> David was in this space, 2 Samuel chapter 6. This is the best day of my life. For as long as David had lived, he had not dreamt of great military victories. He's not dreamt of winning great battles, conquering great nations. He's dreamt of simply hosting the presence of God. From a little kid, that was all he's wanted. Now that he's king in 2 Samuel chapter 6, he actually has an opportunity to host the presence of God because in the Old Testament, the presence of God is not like now where we have him available and readily all the time that we take him for granted. The, t- the, the presence of God was confined to a geographical thing and location and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and an object called the Ark of the Covenant. Cut a long story short, it was taken away into enemy territory. David had an opportunity now to bring it back into the city that he is now the king of, the city of David, a southwestern part of Jerusalem. Make sense to you? This is the greatest day of his life. And in, if you think about the greatest day of your life, whether it was a day where you, you, you graduated or you, whatever, you'd expect that the people that were closest to you would celebrate with you and be right there with you. Yeah, yeah. So we pick up this account in 2 Samuel 6 verse 14. David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting with a sound of trumpet. For those of you that are wondering why we shout, it's because we love the presence of God. Now, as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, which is his wife, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Sounds a bit strange going on here. I'm about to just forewarn you. We're about to eavesdrop in on a bit of a domestic between husband and wife. So you might feel a little bit icky, but it's a little bit morbid that you want to listen more. You know what I'm saying? I know you guys, like in a cafe, you listen to husband and wife fighting, you kind of go... like that so they brought the ark of the lord sat set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that david had erected for it and david offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the lord and david when david had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings he blessed the people in the name of the lord of hosts all of israel was celebrating with him verse 20 then david returned to bless his own household and michael the daughter of saul came out to meet david and said how glorious was the king of israel today uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants as one of the base fellows is the greatest insult you can give to someone at the time. They had to translate it in a much more G-rated version. As one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. Brutal. How does... A wife who supposedly should be celebrating her husband's greatest day respond like this. To, know, to, to, to understand the context, we should understand who Michael actually is. The Bible doesn't give us a whole lot of information about her, but what we do know through commentaries and lexicons and studies and what the Bible tells about her was that if you go press rewind back to 1 Samuel chapter 17 where a young David shows up at the Valley of Elah where Philistines and Goliath was threatening the nation of Israel and the Israelite army. And David rocks up and says, what does the guy who takes down this uncircumcised Philistine actually get? You remember that story? To which they said to him, well, you get tax free for your whole house and you get the hand of the king's daughter in marriage. Cash and the girl, sign me up. That's that. He was was down with that. Well, the hand of marriage of the king's daughter was my cow. David slew a giant for her. David was her first love. And Michael was David's first love. The Bible then goes on to say that David had to kill another 200 Philistines for the rightful right to marry her officially. So incensed that David's profile was rising that Michael's father, King Saul, decided that if I can't kill David, because I'm too old and I can't throw a spear properly, One way I can destroy his life would be to separate these two lovers. And so he chases David like an animal out of the country for him to hide in caves and in the hill country. 
And he mandates, uses his sovereign power to mandate that Michael divorces David in his absence and betroths her to another man by the name of Palti. The Bible goes on to say that God had great mercy on, on, on Michael and Palti really loved her. But life was not kind to Michael. Here she was in love with this ruddy-faced, good-looking shepherd boy that killed a giant for her. But very few things break a heart of a woman than having to choose between the man she loves and the father she honors. She obeys her dad and starts this new life with Palti and every day trying her best to forget this David that she fell in love with. Cut a long story short, after many, many, many years, David has resumed the throne. He is now king. Saul has now died. This is when we pick up this account in 2 Samuel chapter 6, David had now exercised his sovereign right to remarry Michal and issue a decree for her to divorce Palti. Make sense to you? Only now that Michal is reunited with David, he is no longer that good-looking 17-year-old boy that slew a giant for her. He is now an older king. Life had also happened to David. By the time Michael is reunited with David, she is now seventh in line behind six other wives that David had married in her absence. I don't know about you, but that does not go down well for any woman. I don't care how much of The Bachelor you guys have been watching, this does not happen in real life. So here she is, seventh in line. Life was not kind to Michael. And in this moment, we could be forgiven for judging her for what she says to David in his biggest day. But if you understood the context, this was a woman that was broken by life. This was Life has dealt this woman a lot of things to get over. She mocks David, to which David responds in verse 21. It was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord, and I will be even more undignified than this, and will be humble in my own sight. This is a man that understood who his father was. Not his earthly father, but who his heavenly father was. But as for the maidservants of whom you've spoken, by them I will be held in honor. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. If you read the books of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, it speaks of two central characters, David and Michael. To have, these two have two very divergent narratives, both endured heartache, rejection, heartbreak, hardship, agony, pain from life, but both had incredibly divergent outcomes. Think about it for a moment. David's life progressed, but Michael's stalled. David's life was used mightily by God, but Michael's wasn't. David got to leave an incredible legacy. Michael did not we actually ended up seeing the best of David, but the worst of Michael. What's the difference? I can only conclude this one truth. David's heart had scars. Michael's heart had wounds. Two divergent outcomes, both had lives that dealt great hardship. I can only conclude that David had scars, but Michael had wounds. David understood he had, an, he had an astute and powerful insight into this whole thing of the heart way before his time. In fact, so much of David's life prophesied of the Jesus that was to come. David wrote scary things like this, test me, Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind. Woo! How many of you want to pray that prayer? Not me some days. Very few of us would dare say, test me, try me, examine my heart and my mind. As if God doesn't already know. He says, search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Powerful. If you read Further into the Psalms, David had a keen understanding of God, his healer. He says words like, oh, Lord, my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. Yeah. Psalm 147 verse 3, he says this, he heals the brokenhearted. Sound familiar? Yeah. Yeah. 
Who is he talking about? The Christ that is to come. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. David and Michael both had a lot of life thrown at them. They both had wounds, but David had the revelation, I need to turn my wounds into scars. See, David said this, my wounds are foul and festering because of that stupid wife you gave me. Does he say that? My wounds are foul and festering because of that stupid workmate, that work colleague. No, he says, my wounds are foul and festering because of my own foolishness. What is David saying? Not a single person in this room has any control about the kind of wounds that are inflicted upon our hearts. But if we allow it to foul and fester, that's on us because we have a healer. Why would you allow your wounds to foul and fester when Jesus says, right here and now, I am fulfilled in your hearing. The healer is here. Your scars are a gift to the world, but your wounds are gonna infect your world. The greatest gift that you can give to the people that you love is a whole you. The greatest gift that I can give to my wife is not more roses, not more clothes, not more shoes, even though she would love all of those things. The greatest gift I can give our marriage is a whole me. The greatest gift I can give my kids is not more toys, not better kicks, more video games. The greatest gift I can give to them is a whole dad. Jesus knew that my heart is the central motivating factor of my life. And though my life is not perfect, I can at least share my scars with the world. Think about it for a moment. If we all saw Rick and he had a gaping gash in his arm, every single one of you in the room would go, Rick, you need to get that looked at. Come on, is that not your normal response? Rick, wow, that's, that's bad, bro. You need to get that looked at. And if Rick were to do this, no. We'd say, Rick, don't be stupid. Take that to the doctor, right? Why don't we do that with each other's hearts? If we saw a gaping wound in Rick's arm, the first thing we go, go see a doctor because they can fix you. And imagine if Rick actually takes his wound to a doctor. It might hurt a little bit, but over time it's gonna heal. And that healing is gonna turn into a scar. And I can tell you what, if Rick had a whopping big scar on his arm, he's gonna walk around church with sleeveless shirts, man. He's going, wait, bro, Dan, check this out. Hey, have I got a story to tell? See, your scars are the testimony. That it's evidence that you've taken your wound to a healer. Your scars are living proof to the world that though the world has inflicted wounds on your life, you've lived and born into a world of brokenness, you've actually met a healer. And you're presenting the best you, not a life that is perfect or free from all the stuff and the issues, but the narrative is very clear in 1 Samuel or 2 Samuel chapter 6. You can choose the outcome. You can live the Michael narrative or you can live the David narrative. I know which I'd rather because I love you far too much as your leader to inflict the worst of me on you and to hide my wounds and pretend that I can just manage because the best me is a whole me and you deserve a leader that is whole. Come on, are you out there? Our community, our cities deserve churches that are whole, that we've gone to a healer. Yes, we got some scars, but check it out. Have I got a story to tell? Can we give Jesus a big shout of praise? Is that helpful to you guys? Would you stand here for music so you can join me? Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet right now. I want to just shift some gears with you. Just bow your heads, close your eyes just for a moment. We talked about God coming into our world as Jesus. He presents himself as healer of our heart. And I want you to know today that if you take another step back from that, he's actually presenting to you The decision of receiving Him into your life as Lord and Savior to forgive you of all of the things you've done as a first step before you experience Him as healer you got to experience Him as Savior and today in this room if you're far from God 
Or maybe you've never made a decision to ask God to come into your life. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to give you that opportunity right now as we do across all our services to ask Jesus to come into your life or to come back to Him. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to count to three. And when I do, if that's you, I want you to lift your hand so I can see who you are and lead you in a prayer this afternoon. Come on, if you want to ask Jesus into your heart or you want to come back to Him today, one, two, three. Just lift your hand so I can see who you are. I see that hand over there. Wonderful. So good. Get on you, bro. Wonderful. God loves you so much. Anybody else? Anybody else? I see that hand over there. Wonderful. Two hands. So good. Is there anybody else going to join these two very brave, very courageous gentlemen in making this decision? You want to say yes to God? You want to come back to Him? Anybody else? God loves you so much. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that He is Lord, you'll be saved. What does that word even mean? Well, it means that you'll be saved from a life that is separated from Him, out of relationship. This is the start to the best you. I see a third hand over there. Wonderful. So come on, we're a family here, so we're going to repeat this prayer after me, all right? Come on. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you that you're real. And Lord Jesus, we invite you into our lives to become our personal Lord and Savior. Lord Jesus, we repent of everything that we've done. And we ask you to wipe away all of our past. And from this moment, we declare that we are a new creation and have a new life in you. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that from this moment, it is the beginning of our journey of healing and wholeness in you. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen, amen, amen. Come on, you can give Jesus a big shout of praise. Those of you that have put your hand up, ma'am, over there, and sir, sir, our leaders are going to come to you later and give you a Bible, pray with you, speak with you, and talk you through what you've just prayed. But for everybody else, this message, Chrissy and I are particularly passionate about because we've seen how much damage unwhole hearts can do and inflict the world that are around us. And for so many of you, the world actually hasn't seen the best of you. You've lived your life constricted by things that you thought that you could manage. When all along the healer is standing right in front of you saying, today I'm being fulfilled in your hearing. I'm here. I'm here. Maybe there's areas and spaces in your heart today where you know that you are not whole, where you know that I can tell you now the answers are not found in bottles of pills. The answers are not found in throwing yourself more into work. Answers are not found in just stonewalling and silence and let's just cope by just scrolling through our phone a little bit more and not talk about it. Can we just get real before Jesus? Because He got real before us. You need to understand that they hung Him on the cross and what was inflicted upon Him was wounds. But in that, when He said it is finished, it was divinely exchanged with you and that when He came back resurrected, He showed the world His scars. So that today, you don't have to live wounded, but you can show your scars. And if you're here today, the team are going to lead us in this song. And as we do, myself and our pastoral team want to pray with you in any area of your heart today. You're saying, God, I have not been the best of me for those that I love. I've not been the best of me for those that are around me. I've lived constricted by areas in my heart that I've not allowed anyone else to come in. But Hila, would you come and deal with me today? Come on, would you come? Step out of your seat.